Missed y'all last Sunday. I'd rather been here, I promise you that. This is the Lord's Supper. We do have open communion at our church, meaning this. You do not have to be a member of this church because church membership will not save you. If you were born again and blood-bought and are baptized, you're welcome to take the Lord's Supper with us. However, the Bible does tell us that we are to be sure that our sins are confessed. That if you take the Lord's Supper and your sins are not confessed, you're not hurting Christ, but you're hurting yourself. Does anybody here need a, a cup, did not get a cup? Anybody, before we start? Over here, Brother Hugh. Over here. Anybody else? I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward, please. <clears throat> I'm going to read what the Apostle Paul said about the Lord's Supper and how important it is. After I read the Lord's Supper from the, from the viewpoint of the Apostle Paul, We'll ask Brother Ronnie and Brother David to pray over each part of the Lord's Supper. But we all will eat and we all will drink together. So just hold until we all can eat and all can drink together. The Apostle Paul said this, For I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do <clears throat> as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Christ paid the greatest price for us. And we need to always remember what he did on that cross. That cross changed everything. Because of what he did on that cross, we now have the grace of God Almighty, and we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. I want to ask you to take your cup, please, and open the bread part. I'm going to ask Brother David to pray, and when he gets through praying, I'm going to read some scripture again, and we'll all eat together, Brother David. Good Lord, thank you again for all the many blessings that you have given us, say that unseen. But the most wonderful blessing was the sacrifice of your Son for all of us, so we may live forever with you in heaven. All this I ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. Go ahead and open your juice cup. I'm going to ask Brother Ronnie to pray over the cup. When he finishes, I'm going to read the scripture, and then we'll all drink together. Brother Ryan. Lord Father, thank you. Thank you for another day. We just thank you for the many blessings that you give us, dear Lord. But dear Lord, we thank you for the cross. Yes. For what you did at the cross, dear Lord. And we thank you for that divine blood that was shed for our sins, Father. Again, we love you, Father, and we trust you. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
we're so glad that you're here. And do want to encourage you to stay safe and and you know stop shaking hands, fist bump if you want. Use the uh, uh, hand sanitizer. I knew when school started back that we were going to have this issue, but let's just stay safe, okay? We're so glad that you're here. This past week, I was talking to uh, a friend of mine, and they had gone through a a real tough time. Uh, this friend's spouse was a hypochondriac and always cried wolf that they were sick and they were not going to make it. And then they had a medical procedure done and, and came home. And and as normal, they said, the spouse was, was dying, I'm not going to make it. And the spouse actually really was sick. And they, they came and took the spouse to the hospital and the spouse died at the hospital. Uh, the surviving spouse who stayed at home when they took the spouse to the hospital because it, it happened many times and they thought just crying wolf said this to me, I was not prepared. I was not prepared. I, th I thought they'd go to the hospital like they'd done so many times and come home. I, th I thought this was just another way to get attention. I wasn't prepared. Then I had another friend of mine who had just experienced a death in their family. And here's what they said. I was not prepared. I, I was not prepared to see my loved one die. They had a video camera where they could watch their loved ones and I was not prepared for that. And so I got to thinking about us as believers and non-believers, are we prepared? Are we prepared? There, there are three things that you can take to the bank. One of them, you will die. Think about that. You are going to die. Number two, you will face judgment. Bible says that every knee will bow. And then number three, you will confess. What are you going to confess? You're going to confess that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So here's the question. Are you prepared? Are you prepared to die? Are you prepared for the judgment? And are you prepared to confess that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords? I want to ask you to stand to your feet. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, the ninth chapter. Very familiar passage of Scripture. And then we're going to we're going to read that one verse, and we're going to turn over, and we're going to read out of Revelation, the twenty-first chapter. But Hebrews nine and twenty-seven says this: "And as it is appointed for man or men to die once, but after this the judgment. You are going to die." Now, Revelation twenty-one. <clears throat> or Revelation 20, excuse me. Revelation 20 and 11. Revelation 20 and 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead was judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your words. And Lord, I thank you that you've allowed me to stand up here. Lord, this is a hard message today. But Lord, the message that America and the world needs to hear today. There is a judgment day coming and that you are on the throne. Now, Lord, I pray now that you would give us a burden for the lost I pray, God, that the lost that are listening today, that you would prick their hearts 
and convict them, Lord, until they say, yes, Lord. Lord, I pray that your word goes out today and it does exactly what you intend it to do, that we lift up the name of Christ. Now, Lord, I thank you for the little church by the road. I pray for all those that are under the weather today, those that are sick. And I pray, God, that you would touch them and heal them and let them be a mighty testimony for your name. Now, Lord, make me a clean vessel, and Lord, let your word flow through me. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want us to look at three things today. I want us to look first at life and death. I want us to look at being saved or being lost. And I want to look at heaven or hell. And there is things that we can do to change certain things in our lives. But you cannot change the fact that you are going to die. You are going to stand before God, and you are going to confess. The Bible clearly says that. But what you can change today is where do you spend eternity? So first, I want to talk about life and death. It's appointed unto man once to die. If you are alive here today, say amen. amen. Boy, that's weak. All right, you that are alive today here in this room, say amen. All right, that's better. Some of you had me worried, okay? God himself created life. In Genesis 2, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. No matter what evolutionists say, God created man and God created woman. Thank you very much for believing that. It all started with Adam and Eve. And, and we get into this about, about this group of people and that group of people and this skin color and that skin color. Y'all, I want to tell you, we all go back to one man and one woman. So we need to get over ourselves. Somebody said this, that here is seven phases of life. First one is spills, a baby spill stuff. Two is drills. You got to learn all that stuff. Three is thrills as you get older. Four is bills. Can anybody relate to the bills? Number five is eels. Sherry and I can relate to the eels. Number six is pills. And number seven is wheels. Can y'all relate to that? Job said man is born a woman in a few days and full of trouble. James said that life is like a vapor that it appears for a second and then it's gone. There is a common thread throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Here it is. Life is short and death is certain. The world needs to hear this today. In the obituaries, you open them up and you read them and you'll see infant babies all the way to over 100 years old that are in the obituaries. I, I looked this morning and there was a guy I went to school with who's actually a year younger than me and that kind of hits home, you know. But we're all going to die. Life is short and death is certain. And we need to realize that God has blessed us with this life. And he has given us this life so that we may take many, as many people with us through death to heaven. Did you know that? Life is short. We're all going to die. I, I remember as a young man many years ago, how, how I thought life is great. Life is not great. Life is a struggle. Can I get an amen? amen? And it is that quick. I went to bed one night at 30, and I woke up at 60. That's the way it, that's the way it feels. You know, I told Sherry, I said, I went to bed with a young woman, woke up with an old woman. She said, have you looked in the mirror lately, Sparky? <laughs> Hey, if Ricky can play Jeremiah, I can say that, okay? <laughs> so life, life is short and death is certain. So let's look at number two. Let's talk about being saved and lost. Everybody here said you were alive. At least that's what I want to believe. And today you're either saved or you're lost. There is no halfway. There is no almost saved and there is no saved. I was lost. I'm lost again. You're either saved, born again, blood bought, covered in the blood, or you are lost. There may be some people here today who are physically alive but not spiritually alive. I want you to think about that. Just because you signed a card sometime to join a church does not mean that you are saved. In fact, we, we got a we got a lady joining our church today that will not send her to heaven. 
All she is saying is, I want to worship with this body of believers. The Bible says this, God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. God does the saving. God does the adding. So you're either saved or you're lost. Who is saved? John 3.18 says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned. So who's lost? The ones that are lost are the ones that reject the call of Christ because they do not believe. They do not believe. People say, well, I believe. Well, you know what? God says this in James. Do you trust? Do you trust? Do, do, see, the devils believe in Christ. Did you know that? The Bible says they believe in what? They tremble. They're scared of Him. So just because you believe that Jesus is who He says He is does not get you into heaven. There has to come a time where the Holy Spirit calls you and you accept that call, say, yes, I need a Savior. And then here's the biggie. You confess and repent. And repent means to turn from your wicked ways. See, we don't like to talk about that today. We want everybody to come down and feel good, sign a card, and you're all going to heaven. i got news for you. Not everybody is going to heaven. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction, and narrow is the way that leads to heaven. And just because some preacher or somebody on TV stands up and says they went to heaven does not mean that that's where they went. I asked somebody this week, I said, they had lost a loved one. I said this, where are they now? <clears throat> and listen, y'all, I wouldn't have done that five years ago. I wouldn't have put it so plain and so blunt. But let me tell you, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. And this person said this, I want to think that they are in heaven. What makes you think that? Well, they're a good person. They went to Sunday school. They gave to the church. They said a prayer one time. None of those will get you into heaven. Let's talk about those real quick. You say, I prayed a prayer. God asked this, have you surrendered? I'm going to tell you, it's going to shock you. There is no such thing as a sinner's prayer. There is no, 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 no prayer in the Bible that is written down that says, if you pray this, you'll be saved. A sinner's prayer is this, Lord, help me. That is a sinner's prayer. How do I know that? You let somebody be drowned and floating down the Tennessee River. They are not worried about what pretty words they say to get your attention on the bank. They're going to be hollering, help, I'm drowning. You might say this, well, I joined a church. I don't care if you joined every church in Lauderdale County. If you do not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, you are not saved. I'm sorry. You might have been baptized ten times. You might have been baptized in, in the Elk River so you know every tadpole by name. It does not matter unless you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. You say this, I'm a good person. What does the Bible say? The Bible says there is none good, no, not one. So, see, everything that man says it takes to be saved, the Bible says no. Here's what the Bible says. You must believe, confess, and repent. Repent. Turn from your wicked ways. He, Jesus told the woman called adultery, go and sin no more. She had to change her lifestyle. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, the blood of our Savior. The world does not want to hear that. Why? They say it is narrow-minded and that we are, are racist because of that. Listen, I didn't say it. Jesus Christ Himself said it. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. That is plain. You want to get into heaven? you got to go through Jesus Christ. He is not going to stand at the door and ask you what church you belong to, what kind of car you drove, how much money you had in the bank, what your last name was, how much money you can pay Him to get in. The only way you're going to get into heaven is through the blood of Jesus Christ and your name written in the Lamb's book of life. That's it. That is the only way you're going to get there. Judgment is coming, y'all. Judgment is coming. I don't know when God's coming back. I don't know when He's going to rapture the church. That's none of my business. Here is my business. I got to make sure I'm prepared for when He calls me. I got to make sure I'm prepared when He calls me. How can I be prepared? I know that I'm covered in the blood. I know that Jesus has forgiven my sins. 
I know that He is there waiting on me. And you need to know today, are you saved or are you lost? The Bible makes it clear in Ephesians that we are saved by grace, not works. So I, I read in Revelation a while ago where it talked about our works is going to be tested by fire and they're either going to burn up or they're not. But listen, y'all, that is not what saves you. The works that the Bible is talking about are the works that we do because we love God. I want you to hear that. You cannot work your way into heaven. You cannot earn your way into heaven. James says this, I do the things that I do because I love Jesus Christ, not because I, it'll get me a ticket into heaven. There is no other way except through Jesus Christ. The saved person will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It says in 2 Corinthians, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may perceive the things done in the body according to he that hath done it, whether it be good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is where every believer will stand before God. The Bible even says that you may be a believer and you may be saved, but you haven't done any works. And here's what it says. You're still going to get into heaven by the skin of your teeth. And listen, how many in here has got skin on your teeth? Okay, just, just double checking. You're going to stand before God to give an account for the deeds that you have done after you were saved. Now, why do we do these deeds? Because we love God. Why do you do the things for your family? Because you love your family. Why do we do the things for the girl branch? Because we love the girl branch. Why, why do we do things? Because we love people. God does not come down every day and hit you in the head and say, All right, Ronnie, I want you to do five of these today, and, and you've got to have two of them done by noon. And if you do that, you'll show me you love me. No. No. We do the things God calls us to do. Because we love Him. Here, here's what the Bible says. To obey is better than sacrifice. God wants our obedience. When He says, Lily, I want you to do this, you've got to say, yes, Lord. Amen. You cannot say, no, Lord. Think about it. They do not go together. If you say no, He's not your Lord. Think about it now. So the believers are going to stand there. But the unbelievers... The unbelievers, the one who have rejected the call are going to stand before the great white throne judgment. Now I want you to get this. Born twice, meaning you were born in human flesh, and you were born again covered in the blood, you're going to have one judgment. But if you were born physically, never had a spiritual birth, then you're going to be judged twice. And that's scary. That, that is scary. And here, here's what's amazing. People are going to stand there in front of that great white throne judgment and argue with God. They're going to say, but God, did I not do this? Did I not do that? They're, they're arguing with the perfect creator, the one who can make no mistake. They are arguing with God. So what that tells me? That tells me that they think they are smarter than God. They do not know God. That's why it's important that we do what God has called us to do now, y'all, because our world is dying and going to hell. And I would hate to think about I ran into somebody and I did not share the good news of God with them and then think about them dying and going to hell. We have the good news. God loves you. He died for you. He rose from the dead on the third day. Now, who's going to be at this great white throne? Well, the Bible says, I saw the dead, great and small. What does that mean? Little midgets and tall giants? No. It means people that had authority in this earth and people that didn't have authority in this earth. And I don't care who you are, you can be the king of the world, you will still stand before God Almighty. And God will judge you. You will not judge God. That's how powerful He is. So who's going to be there? Good people. Good people will be there. People we think are good. They've never accepted Christ. 
people that we see do good things all the time and we think are good neighbors and, and all this stuff. And according to the moral, moral code of the world, they are good, but they do not know Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you who else is going to be there. The religious people. The religious people are going to be there. The ones who stood up and preached the message. The ones who stood up and preached for money or who did this or who did that for whatever reason. The ones who changed the Word of God and preached a different gospel. Those religious people are going to be there. Respected people. There's going to be judges. There's going to be politicians. There's going to be lawyers. There's going to be real estate agents. There's going to be deacons. There's going to be pastors all standing at the great white throne because they did not know Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you this. Do you think some of your family will be standing there? Is your family saved today? Do you know that? Does it, do you even think about that? That's, that's a terrible thing to think about. Because we think about heaven, we want to think about all the great things, and we'll get to that in just a minute. And one of the great things we think about is spending time with our family. Amen? i got five brothers and sisters I never met. I want to spend time with them. I know they're there. But do you know if your family was to die right now where they were going? Do you know that? Are you ashamed to have that conversation with them? Do you love them enough to have that conversation with them? What about your friends? Do you know if your friends are saved? Does it even matter? Yes, it matters. Yes, it matters. Jesus said the shepherd will leave the 99 and go get the one. That one could be you, it could be your family, or it could be your friends. And you could be the one that would point them to Jesus Christ. Do you know if you'll be there or not? Do you know for a fact that you're saved? God said in the Bible, He said, I write this book, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, that you may know. Here's what the world would tell you. There's no way you can know if you're saved or not. Hogwash. Hogwash. This book says I can know. How am I going to know? Because there's a change in me. Something happened. I didn't get new and improved like joy detergent. I got changed from the inside out. The Apostle Paul said the things I once loved I now hate. And buddy, can I relate to that? The things I once hated I now love. Buddy, can I relate to that? The Apostle Paul said God did the changing. I got the benefit. Many years ago, a man conned his way into the great orchestra of the Chinese emperor. Now this man could not play a note. He could not play a note on this instrument. But the orchestra was so big, he conned his way in. And whenever they would play, he would put his lips up to the flute, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't make a sound. And he would just go through the motions. And, and he, he fooled them for years. And he lived a comfortable life because being the communist dictator, those that do good things like that get stuff. But one day the emperor said he wanted a concert from each individual member of the orchestra. He wanted to hear them play by themselves. Well, as you can imagine, this man struck fear in his heart. He didn't know what to do because he couldn't play a note, and he knew he didn't have time to learn it. So he went to the doctor and tried to fake being sick, and the doctor, the doctor knew he was not sick and would not give him an excuse. And so the man went home the night before he was supposed to play before the emperor and killed himself. And actually, that's where we get the, the phrase, he was afraid to face the music. Are you ready to face the music? If God was to call you home right now, you had to stand before him. Are you going to hear, enter in that good and faithful servant? Or are you going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you? Are you faking it as a Christian? You may fool me. You may fool your wife or your husband. You may fool your neighbors. You may fool your mom, your dad, your sisters, your brothers. You are not fooling God 
at all. If you are lost today and you were to die right now, you will stand before God to give an account. And it will be too late. Now let's talk about heaven and hell real quick. This is the good part and the bad part. Jesus promised his followers of a place of rest. Heaven is great because who is there and who is not there. It's great because of what there is there and also what there's not there. Listen, there's going to be no sickness, no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no death. There'll be no funeral homes, no nursing homes, no hospitals, no mental institutions, no prisons, no divorce, no child abductions, no accidents, no more taxes. Hello? That didn't get y'all excited, did it? How about no more bills? No more power bills, no more water bills, no more gas bills. How about that? No more rapes, no more murders, no more burglaries, no more molestation, no more crime of any kind, no more cancer. Can I get an amen? No diabetes, no strokes, no heart problems, no arthritis, no colds, no, no, no reason to go to the doctor. Doctors will be out of business. Can I get an amen? <sighs> no more antichrist. Think about that. No more false prophet, no more demons, and most importantly, no more devil. Think about that, y'all. I'm excited about who and what's not going to be in heaven, but also I can't wait to see my loved ones. I can't wait to spend eternity with you all. Let me give you all some good news. You won't have to hear me preach no more. There'll be no preaching in heaven. Y'all like that one, didn't you? Y'all like that one. But the greatest thing in heaven, I get to see Jesus Christ. I get to look at the nail scars. I get to reach in his side and feel where they pierced his side. I get to lay my crowns at his feet. And, and there's, there's so much debate about where is heaven, what is heaven. Listen, I don't care where it is. I don't care what it is. If Jesus is there, it's heaven. It, it is heaven, y'all. And, and I don't care how, how great it is because I can't understand how great it is. If Jesus is there, there's nothing else needed. Amen. Nothing. But what about the folks that go to hell? You know, the Bible talks about hell seven times more than it does heaven. Seven times. Why do you think that's important? The more you talk about something, the more important it should be to you and to others. Jesus does not want anybody to go to hell. And I've had people say, I can't believe God would send a good person to hell. First of all, I'm going to go back. There is no good person. Second of all, he does not send you to hell. You send yourself to hell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him. What? Believeth on him. See, he didn't want us to go. Hell was not prepared for us. Did you know that? It was not. But God is so holy, he cannot look upon sin. So, so back in the beginning of time when he made Adam and Eve, you know what? He had a plan for our salvation. It did not catch guard, God off guard. He had a plan for our salvation. He had a plan for grace. He had a plan to take us from where we are now to take us to be with Him. But He gave us a free choice. That's why that, when that Holy Spirit convicts your heart, it is so important that you say, Yes, Lord. He may not convict you again. See, I, I can see God, I, and y'all know my mind works weird. I, I can see God in His infinite mercy. He, he's there, and He's on the throne, and it's the great white throne judgment. And, and there are religious people, and there are good people, and there are these and those, and they're standing before Him, and they're pleading with God. Did, did we not do this? And God's got that book. And he looks at me and said, I can't find your name anywhere. And, and I can just see people pleading with God, God, you made a mistake. Look again. I've got to be in there. And, and I believe in the, 
mercy of God. It says his mercy is renewed daily. I, I believe he looks again and says, you're not in there. And as they're dragging this person away, I, I believe it is breaking God's heart. Because he loved us so much. He did not die just for the people in this building. Jesus did not die just for the saved people who are going to be in heaven. He died for everyone, y'all. Now I want you to put your face there. I want you to see that judgment. And I, I want you to see all the multitude of people that are standing there. But I don't want you to just to see little dots. I want you to put a face on, on those faces. I want you to put your family on there. Are they saved? Can't tell you the time Sherry and I agonized over Key. God answered that prayer. Amen. Well, see, we got we got to put faces in the flames, y'all. We we think about people dying and going to hell, and all it's just a just a mass of people. Listen, those people were born and they lived, and God created them, and God loves them, and we got to see people as as not as black and white or yellow and green or good and bad or rich and poor. We got to see them as lost or saved. And we've got to have a compassionate heart. We, we need to believe what I'm preaching this morning so much that we are knocking on doors saying, let me tell you what God did for me. We need to go home and hit our knees and say, God, is my family saved? Is my family saved? Are they going to hear, depart from me, I never do you? See, that don't, that don't bother us, y'all. We, we, need, we need to quit worrying about the things of this world and put them on eternal things. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you. I'm, time is running out. So I'm going to go back and I'm through. Here, here it is. Everybody's going to die. Everybody. Well, preacher, I believe in the rapture. That's great. I do too. And we may be raptured out of here today, but either way, this body's going to die, y'all. It's going to die. So whether I'm jerked out of here today or they lay me in Oaks and Nichols funeral home and put me in the ground, I'm going to die. Everybody. You will be judged, number two. You will be judged. There's no way out of it. Ronnie, you can't buy your way out of it. You can't be good enough to go around it. You can't be bad enough to go the other direction. I will not be judged. I'm just going to hell. No, you're going to be judged. And you will confess. You will bow before God Almighty and confess that He is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now the question is this, and I'm through. Are you going to bow on this side of the grave or that side of the grave. See, if the Holy Spirit's convicting you right now, you've got a choice. I'm not talking about signing a card when you were a kid. I'm not talking about walking down and getting baptized because everybody in my class did it. I'm not talking about an emotional high where I was scared and I'm trying to get a ticket out of hell. I'm not, I'm not talking about like I used to do when I'd get in trouble with my mama. I'd go to the altar and cry a little and mama would forgive me and everything was good. Uh, I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ where there has been a time in your life where the Holy Spirit said you are lost and you need a Savior and you said, yes, Lord, like the Apostle Paul did on the road to Damascus, and you confess that He is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that you need a Savior, and that you're a sinner, and you repent and say, God, forgive me. Amen. That's what I'm talking about. So has that happened in your life? Has it happened in your family's life? If not, whose fault is it? Why, if you're not saved, why has God not been able to save you? Now, I want you to think about that. If you're not saved, or your family is not saved, why has God not been able to save them? I asked that one time at a hunting lodge from guys from Kentucky that make David Charles look like a lightweight, but these were young guys, and that guy just stopped right in mid-breakfast. Mid 
And I thought, man, I've done it now. My mouth, it doesn't get me in trouble. I'm going to be, my head's going to be hanging on the wall like some of these here animals here. And he just stopped, right? And he, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I guess it's my fault, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. And you know what? That guy gave me his mail. I, well, they didn't have email back in them days. And I sent him some scriptures and I sent him a Bible. And the last I heard, he had gotten saved. So here's the question. Why hadn't God been able to save you? Don't look at your wife. Don't look at your husband. Don't look at anything. Don't make excuses. Well, God, it's your fault. It is not God's fault. I want to ask you to stand to your feet and bow your heads. No music. Stand to your feet. Every head bowed, please. Nobody leave.